Welcome to the enigma that is ancient Mesopotamia, the land cradled by the Tigris and Euphrates, birthplace of cities and writing. Its secrets are many, hidden beneath the sands and untold by history. The geographical advantage of Mesopotamia cannot be understated. Control of this region meant power, wealth, and, inevitably, the envy of others. It's no wonder it became the stage for the earliest dramas of civilization. Indeed, Polybius and these dramas were not just of power and conquest, but of the human spirit and mind. The invention of cuneiform writing here was as revolutionary as the wheel. Let us not romanticize too hastily. The prowess of Mesopotamia's geography also made it a constant target for invasion and subject to the whims of nature itself. Its history is a testament to the resilience and ingenuity of its people amidst such turmoil. Resilience that is emblematic of the human condition. The tales of Mesopotamia inspire, its rise, zenith, and eventual decline mirror the epic sagas of Rome. In its story, we see our reflection, or perhaps our warning. Mesopotamia's fall illustrates the corruption and short-sightedness that plagues empires. Their legacies are cautionary tales, not just of what we achieve, but of what we risk becoming. A poignant observation, almost as haunting as the tales whispered down the Euphrates. This land's narrative is a mosaic, complex and colorful, each piece a story of humanity's quest for meaning, order, and dominion over its fate. And let's not forget the characters who walked its streets, the kings and commoners, priests and scribes, whose lives paint the human aspect of this civilization. Their ambitions, innovations, and flaws resonate through time, more vivid than any monument they left behind. Each of you brings a perspective as diverse as the lands that fed the Euphrates. So let us delve deeper into this ancient cradle to explore not just the events that shaped it, but the ideas and people who defined it. Mesopotamia's history is a chronicle of firsts. First cities, first laws, first battles for empire. What does this legacy tell us about civilization itself? It speaks of humanity's unending quest for order amidst the chaos of existence, a testament to our resilience and our hubris. As we will see, Mesopotamia's story is not just of a place or time, but of us all. It is a reflection of humanity's boundless ambition and its inevitable imperfections. Let us begin. Let us delve straight into the heart of Mesopotamian civilization, the cuneiform writing. Its invention was a cornerstone, enabling not just communication, but the very fabric of their civilization to hold. Indeed, the pragmatism behind cuneiform's creation cannot be understated. It facilitated the complexities of trade and governance. Consider its role in recording transactions and laws, a true testament to human ingenuity in the face of necessity. Yet, one must assess its broader implications. Cuneiform enabled the emergence of bureaucratic systems, a double-edged sword. It organized society, but also entrenched power structures, making historical records prone to manipulation by those in authority. Beyond mere pragmatism, Cuneiform was a vessel of culture and morality. Each tablet is a voice from the past, an echo of ancient values and beliefs. It's not just administrative records, it's poetry, law and wisdom passed down through generations. And yet let us not idealize excessively. This tool, like any other, was wielded for propaganda. Rulers inscribed their version of truths, immortalizing their conquests and decrees. It's naive to see cuneiform solely as a beacon of civilization without acknowledging its role in consolidating power through narrative control. The personal stories behind those who created and used cuneiform are truly fascinating. Imagine the scribe toiling away, etching into clay. There's a tangible human element in each stroke, a story of not just kings and gods, but also of the common man, his life and his labors. While personal anecdotes are intriguing, Suetonius, Let's not lose sight of cuneiform's broader impact on administrative efficiency and governance. It's the foundation upon which empires were built and managed. Governance, yes, but at what cost? The creation of such systems also sowed the seeds of division and hierarchy. The power to record is also the power to rewrite history in favor of the victor. My dear Thucydides, you miss the forest for the trees. Cuneiform was a beacon of progress a step toward our shared humanistic ideals. It's a legacy of intellect and spirit, a testament to our quest for understanding and order. Livy, your idealization ignores the darker aspects of such progress. Every inscription was a potential instrument of control, 
a way to cement the ruler's legacy, often at the expense of truth. Indeed, each of you brings a shard of truth to this mosaic. Cuneiform was both a tool of enlightenment and control, embodying the complexities of human civilization. Its legacy is fraught with both our greatest achievements and our most enduring conflicts. Let us traverse back to the era of city-states in Sumer, that ancient canvas where politics painted its first grand strokes. The rise and fall of these entities aren't merely episodes of history, but lessons on the fragility of human constructs. Indeed, Herodotus. What fascinates me as I studied the cyclical rise and dominance in the Mediterranean is the stark parallel in the Sumerian city-states. Their strategic prowess, not unlike the Romans, was commendable. However, their downfall was a predictable outcome of failing geopolitics and internal strife, a fate no empire seems to escape. Polybius, your comparison holds. But remember, strategy is but one facet. The internal mechanisms of these city-states, their democracy, oligarchy, tyranny, resembled a petri dish for political experimentation. Yet, as I've observed in Athens, internal conflict weakened them, making them prey to external forces. Their fall was inevitable not just predictable. Both of you speak of strategy and politics, yet overlook the valor and spirit that birthed these city-states. They were more than political entities. They were the embodiment of human aspiration and courageous endeavor. Their rise illustrates the glory humanity can achieve when united towards a common goal. Ah, Livy, your romanticism is as misplaced here as it is in your chronicles of Rome. The city-states fell because of greed, corruption, and short-sighted leadership, much like the emperors I've dissected in my annals. The Sumerians were no paragons. Their leaders were as susceptible to tyranny and decadence as any. This isn't about valor. It's about the inherent flaws within power structures. Tacitus, while your cynicism is not unwarranted, we must not overlook the complex interplay of environment and society. The climatic and geographical challenges they faced necessitated certain political and economic strategies. Their fall illustrates a failure to adapt and evolve, a lesson as pertinent to statecraft as to survival. Tacitus, Polybius, your insights reveal the multifaceted nature of the Sumerian saga. Yet, in each demise there seems to be a strand of human resilience. They sowed the seeds for future civilizations to harvest. Their legacy both in failure and success educates us even today. Herodotus, while resilience is a commendable trait, let us not romanticize the inevitable cycle of power that devours all civilizations. The Sumerian story teaches us about the dangers of hubris and the eternal struggle for balance between ambition and governance. Yet, it is in studying these ancient tales of rise and fall that we find guidance for the future. Their spirit, though buried in the sands of time, inspires our continued quest for greatness. Inspiration, perhaps. But let it also be a cautionary tale that power unchecked by virtue leads to ruin. As I have shown through the moral decay of Rome's leaders, so too the Sumerian city-states exemplify the grave cost of corruption and misrule. A compelling discussion, indeed. The rise and fall of the Sumerian city-states not only narrate the chronicles of human ambition and frailty, but also serve as enduring lessons on the complexities of civilization itself. May we continue to learn from their history as we forge our own. We now turn our gaze to the Akkadian Empire, its iron grip upon diverse regions and the cultural mosaic it crafted. The Akkadians, under Sargon, showcased a ruthless efficiency in their administrative strategies, a practice I respect for its clear-eyed realism. They mastered the art of power consolidation, something many empires, including Rome, have aspired to. Efficiency, yes, but at what cost? Their military might was undeniable yet their success was built upon the ruins of those they conquered. The empire's administrative prowess was merely a veil for its relentless ambition. Yet, one cannot help but admire the unity and prosperity that bloomed under their rule. The Akkadian Empire was a beacon of civilizational achievement, a testament to the heights humanity can reach when united under a singular, though perhaps iron-fisted vision. Unity and prosperity for whom? The Akkadian Empire was as oppressive as it was grand. Prosperity flourished atop an undercurrent of fear. They expanded not through the love of their subjects, but through the terror they instilled. 
their downfall was as inevitable as it was deserved. Indeed, the Akkadian expansion touched many, facilitating an unprecedented cultural exchange. Yet, one wonders if the price paid in blood and freedom was worth the tapestry of cultures it wove. An empire's success must indeed be weighed against the methods it employs. Sargon's methods, though effective, underpinned an essential fragility. The reliance on military might and oppression foreshadowed the empire's vulnerability to internal dissension and external pressures. Such is the fate of empires that overextend. The Akkadian Empire, like Athens in the Peloponnesian War, illustrates the perils of hubris and overambition. The societal and environmental strains eventually eroded its foundations, a cycle repeated through history. But let us not forget the cultural and administrative advancements achieved under Akkadian rule. Their contributions to Mesopotamian civilization were immense, laying the groundwork for future empires. Contributions, perhaps, but at the end point, all empires, including the Akkadian, are measured not by their temporary triumphs, but by their ultimate failure to sustain the very world they sought to control. The Akkadian Empire, grandiose in ambition and tragic in downfall, serves as a compelling chapter in the annals of civilization, a narrative of human endeavor, its reach and its limitations. Let us delve into the Code of Hammurabi, a testament to the complexities of ancient governance. Its detailed stipulations present a nascent yet sophisticated attempt at a standardized legal framework. However, it's imperative to scrutinize its balance or lack thereof within society. While the sophistication of such a legal code cannot be denied, one must question the practical implications of its implementation. It espoused a principle of retribution, lex talionis, that on the surface appears to encapsulate fairness. Yet, when scrutinized, it's evident that its application heavily favored the upper echelons of society. Indeed, but one cannot overlook the idealism it represented, a striving towards a regulated society where order governs over chaos. This code, with its divine sanction, sought to instill a moral compendium within the heart of Mesopotamian civilization, heralding a new dawn of justice. Yet, what is justice but a cloak for the exercise of power? The Code of Hammurabi, praised for its pioneering vision, was equally a tool for coercion, an instrument in the hands of a ruler to assert dominance over his subjects. The severity of some laws under the guise of justice only perpetuated the ruler's absolute control. To understand the real Hammurabi, one must peel away the layers of legend and look at the anecdotes of his time. Through these tales, we glimpse not just a lawmaker, but a figure who skillfully blended the divine with the temporal, crafting his image as both a godly figure and a terrestrial sovereign. However, disjointed anecdotes do not form a coherent analysis of his legal legacy. The code, irrespective of its partiality, was revolutionary. It laid down a precedent that transcended its immediate milieu, influencing subsequent legal systems profoundly. The discussion here underscores the multifaceted legacy of Hammurabi's code. Its impact on future civilizations cannot be underestimated, serving not only as a legal cornerstone but also as a cultural artifact, encapsulating the zeitgeist of Mesopotamian society at its zenith. And yet, its justice often felt more like an iron fist than a guiding hand. The code existed within a culture where power dictated law and law served the powerful, a reality that must not be glossed over in our retrospection. Such cynicism detracts from the greater picture. The code represents a beacon of progress, illuminating the path from might is right towards a society governed by standardized laws. It's a leap towards civilization we should not disparage lightly. A leap, perhaps, but into what? The shadows within Hammurabi's laws hide much of the despotism and cruelty that characterized his reign. Progress towards civilization is a path fraught with manipulation and violence, embodied starkly in his code. Despite the debate, one cannot ignore the narratives of those who lived under Hammurabi's laws. Their stories breathe life into the dusty edicts and inscriptions, reminding us of the human element often lost in grand proclamations of justice and governance. Our discussion unveils the complexity of Hammurabi's code, reflecting the eternal struggle between the ideals of justice and the exercise of power. 
Its legacy, though contentious, remains a pivotal point in the annals of history, a marker of humanity's ceaseless quest for order amidst the chaos of existence. The Assyrian military machine was unparalleled in its day, a force of nature that reshaped the landscape of the Near East with its relentless campaigns. Indeed, their logistical organization was impressive. The Assyrians understood better than any the importance of maintaining supply lines and quick movement of troops. Their use of specialized units and siege techniques allowed them to subjugate territories far and wide. But this was a double-edged sword. The empire became overstretched, a victim of its success. The effectiveness of these tactics cannot be overstated, yet one must question at what cost. The Assyrians were brutal in their suppression of dissent, using fear as a weapon. Such a strategy is effective in the short term, but sows the seeds of long-term instability. It breaks my heart to think of the cultures lost, the people uprooted from their homelands. The Assyrians may have built an empire, but at what cost to the rich tapestry of human history? The brutality of the Assyrian conquest was not an oversight. It was a calculated effort to instill fear, such cruelty, they were architects of terror. Yet, as always, tyranny contains the seeds of its downfall. The more peoples they subjugated, the more enemies they made. Their unsustainability was not just logistic, but moral. And yet, it's the psychological toll on those conquered peoples that often goes unspoken. One can scarcely imagine the dread they felt at the approach of the Assyrian army, knowing the reputation that preceded them. Army logistics and moral considerations aside, it's crucial to understand the strategic foresight the Assyrians had. They built roads, fortified positions, and established supply depots, allowing them to project power over great distances unheard of until then. But these advancements in military logistics should not distract us from the human cost of their empire's expansion. The legacy of their conquests is one of blood and ashes. An empire built on fear is like a colossus with feet of clay, doomed to collapse under its weight. There's a melancholy aspect to their story. The Assyrians could have been remembered for more than their conquests and brutality. Among the ashes of war, sparks of potential cultural achievements and contributions to human knowledge were smothered. Their story is a testament to the folly of overreach, a lesson that many empires would ignore in the centuries that followed. The Assyrians are but one chapter in the long narrative of human hubris facing the immutable verdict of history. We now turn our gaze to the stars, as did the Babylonians, whose astronomy influenced countless cultures. Their empirical pursuit to understand celestial patterns is both admirable and foundational to human knowledge. Indeed, their contributions were not merely academic. Babylonian astronomy had practical applications, guiding agricultural schedules and creating a calendar system that served as a backbone for their society. The meticulous nature in which they recorded planetary movements showcases a blend of empirical observation and the necessities of an agrarian society. While their achievements in astronomy are noteworthy, we must not overlook the speculative nature of their astrology. Skepticism towards the influence of celestial bodies on terrestrial events was evident even in our times. Their empirical observations were sound, but the leap to astrological interpretations often strayed from the path of rigorous inquiry. Yet, can we simply dismiss the grandeur of their pursuit? The Babylonians not only sought to understand the heavens, but to connect them to the human experience. Their mythology and astrological interpretations enriched their culture and provided a lens through which they viewed their world and their place within it. The grandeur you admire was in essence a tool for control. Astrology, while based on empirical observations, served the powerful by cloaking authority in the mystique of celestial decree. The Babylonians were astute, but let's not naively romanticize their motivations. Their leaders used these interpretations to solidify their rule, weaving inevitability into the fabric of their governance. Yet it is through the merging of the celestial with the terrestrial that cultures find meaning. The Babylonians were pioneers, their contributions laying the groundwork for Greek astronomy and beyond. Their legacy is undeniable. However, their influence on later cultures, particularly the Greeks, 
was not just a transmission of knowledge, but a transformation. The Greeks were inspired but not constrained by Babylonian thought, pushing the boundaries of astronomy further toward the cosmos, yet unexplored. It is the critical examination of such influences that allows us to discern the line between empirical science and the human inclination towards finding patterns and meanings where there may be none. The Babylonians set us on a path, but it was through questioning and skepticism that we advanced beyond the stars they charted. In dismissing their mythology and astrological beliefs, we risk undermining the very essence of their culture. It is not merely the empirical advancements, but the pursuit of understanding and the quest for meaning that characterizes the greatness of Babylonian astronomy. A fine line treads between admiration and critique. While their empirical observations are commendable, their use as instruments of power cannot be overlooked. The legacy of Babylonian astronomy is thus a dual-edged sword, cutting through the annals of history as both a beacon of human achievement and a tool for dominion. As we debate their legacy, let us remember the Babylonians gazed upon the same stars we do tonight. Their curiosity, ambition, and achievements marked the beginning of a journey that all civilizations have since continued. The Neo-Assyrian Empire, an empire of great administration and cultural achievements. How did this administration function so effectively over such a vast territory? The administrative system of the Neo-Assyrian Empire was a marvel of its time, highly centralized, with a tight grip on its provinces through governors and a network of spies. This was not just about control, but ensuring efficient communication and swift execution of royal decrees. They understood, as I have written, the importance of a well-organized state in maintaining power and prosperity. Yet, one could argue that their administrative practices were a double-edged sword. The efficiency came at the cost of harshness and fear, a common theme in the governance of empires. Their stability was built on the uneasy bedrock of terror and oppression. An empire can only stretch so far on the backs of its subdued peoples before it starts to crack. It's disheartening to see the focus solely on administrative efficiency and military might. The Neo-Assyrians did more than just conquer and administer. They were builders of great cities, patrons of the arts, and preservers of knowledge. Their libraries, like the famous one at Nineveh, speak to a desire to celebrate and immortalize human achievement. Their reign, though marred by conquest, was also a golden age for Mesopotamian culture and scholarship. Let's not adorn tyranny with the laurels of culture and scholarship too hastily. The grandeur of their cities and the depth of their libraries served equally as propaganda, immortalizing the ruler as much as the realm. Theirs was an administration that knew the value of fear and used it unhesitatingly. The empire's longevity and its cultural achievements were, in fact, built on a foundation of relentless suppression and exploitation. Indeed, the personal anecdotes of those who lived under the Neo-Assyrian rule tell us much about the era. From Ashurbanipal's boastful inscriptions, claiming to have slain lions and quelled rebellions with his own hands, to tales of common folk who lived in the shadow of such tyranny. These stories paint a vivid picture of life in the empire, both at the top and at the bottom. The administration's means of control were undeniably effective, but they also inspired a unique blend of fear, respect, and sometimes even admiration among its subjects. So it seems the legacy of the Neo-Assyrian Empire is as complex as it is fascinating. A testament to human ingenuity in governance and culture, yet a cautionary tale of the perils of absolute power. The cyclical nature of civilizations flourishing and falling is ever so evident in their story. Let us now delve into the complex web of trade networks and economic strategies that defined late Bronze Age Mesopotamia. Polybius, would you lead us off with your analysis? Indeed, Herodotus. The trade networks of Mesopotamia were the arteries of civilization, pumping vital resources across vast territories. But let's not romanticize. These networks were as much about political dominance as economic necessity. They allowed powerful city-states to control weaker ones, using economic strategies as extensions of their military and political might. While Polybius champions the strategic brilliance behind these networks, I question their durability and fairness. 
history has shown that imbalance leads to conflict. The prosperity of a few on the backs of many is a recipe for internal strife and eventual downfall. This was as true in Mesopotamia as it was in the Peloponnesian War. Both of you talk of domination and conflict, but what of the cultural exchange these trade networks facilitated? They were the sinews that connected diverse peoples, bringing about an era of mutual prosperity and shared achievements. To overlook the role of trade in the spread of ideas, languages, and religions is to miss the essence of these interactions. Livy, your idealism blinds you. These networks were not harmonious symposiums of cultural exchange, but mechanisms of exploitation. The elite's concentration of wealth was obscene. They were not about mutual prosperity, but the preservation and expansion of power. The Roman Empire, too, saw such disparities which sowed the seeds of its own decay. What of the anecdotes and specific accounts? Suetonius, can you breathe life into this discussion with tales from those times? I could regale you with stories of traders and caravans laden with goods as exotic as the lands they came from. Yet what intrigues me more are the individual lives that these trade networks touched. There were fortunes made and lost, adventures to be had, but at its core, this was a human experience, people striving, surviving, and sometimes thriving in the crucible of commerce. My point is not that exploitation did not occur but that we must not overlook the structural genius behind these networks. They were master classes in administrative control and logistical planning, lessons that could benefit any state, ancient or modern. Genius or not, the inherent instability and unfairness could not be sustained forever. The collapse of such a system was inevitable, as internal weaknesses were exposed and external pressures mounted. Yet, the legacy of these networks, the cultural and intellectual exchanges, far outlives their economic or political imperatives. This is the true measure of their worth. A legacy built on inequality, nonetheless. We do well to remember that. It seems, then, that our views on trade in ancient Mesopotamia span a spectrum from admiration to cynicism. But what is clear is its profound impact on the civilization's development for better or worse. Let us now ponder on the gods of Mesopotamia, whose caprice shaped not just the heavens and the earth, but also the destinies of men and empires. The pantheon of this land was as rich as the soil nurtured by the twin rivers. Indeed, religion played a pivotal role in governance. The integration of divine mandates into political authority stabilized and justified rulership. Yet this reliance perhaps also ossified political structures, making adaptation to new challenges slower. I find the pressing integration of gods into the state mechanism a double-edged sword. While it provided a semblance of order, it equally warranted despots who claimed divine right, suppressing dissent in the guise of piety, the folly of men veiled as the will of gods. You overlook the grandeur of mythology, Thucydides. The legends of Mesopotamian gods and heroes instilled values and virtues. They did not merely serve as tools for the ambitions of tyrants, but also as the cultural heartbeat of a civilization, offering solace and explanation to humanity's existential queries. Yet, how often did this heartbeat become a tool for manipulation? The priesthood wielded immeasurable power, directing the fears and hopes of the populace towards the maintenance of an established order that benefited the few under the guise of divine decree. On that matter, I uncovered tales of priests and rulers indulging in excess, claiming divine favor as justification. The line between man and God blurred, corrupting the very essence of religious purpose. It was not just about keeping order, but sustaining a divine facade of immortality and unerring authority. And so the gods of Mesopotamia cast long shadows over its lands. From the ziggurats reaching for the heavens to the rituals that promised fertility and victory, the divine intertwined with the daily life of every inhabitant, shaping the fabric of their reality in ways profound and complex. Nonetheless, we must acknowledge the instrumental use of religion in uniting disparate cultures under the vast empires. The shared worship of gods, even if imposed, fostered a semblance of unity, a common identity among the diverse peoples of Mesopotamia. Is unity forged through subjugation and fear truly laudable? It seems the shadow of the divine was often a cloak for tyranny. But we must not ignore the beauty such reverence for the gods brought forth. 
literature, art, and monumental architecture dedicated to their honor. These achievements outlast the rulers and reach us, millennia later, as witnesses to human devotion and creativity. Witness, if you will, the Cyril of Alexandria cloaking his political maneuvers in piety. Have we not seen the same in Mesopotamia? The narrative of divine support is potent, often too potent for the good of the many. One cannot help but wonder at the personal lives of those who lived under such divine shadows. Their faith, their fears, were they not but pawns in a greater game played by those in power, masked under the omniscient gaze of gods? Our discourse unveils the multifaceted nature of Mesopotamian religion, a cornerstone that upheld, manipulated, inspired, and at times subjugated the spirits of its people. Yet its legacy endures, infinitely complex, echoing the human condition throughout history. Mesopotamia's downfall wasn't a mere loss of power. It was a symphony of failures, interludes of resistance leading to an inevitable finale under the Achaemenid Empire. But let's remember in its ashes, a phoenix of cultural and intellectual contributions arose to influence its conquerors. Indeed, the strategic blunders cannot be understated. Mesopotamian leaders failed to adapt to see the broader geopolitical landscape changing around them. They clung to old alliances, underestimated external threats, and overestimated their own strengths. It's a classic tale of demise, one I have seen repeated in the histories I've documented. The inevitability of their decline wasn't just due to poor strategy. Internal corruption and societal decay played just as critical roles. A state that cannot maintain its own integrity is ripe for conquest. The Achaemenids merely capitalized on what was already crumbling from within. Yet, in this narrative of decline, we must not forget the triumphs of Mesopotamian civilization. Their architectural achievements, their laws, their very culture. The Achaemenids themselves adopted and adapted many aspects. It was not all loss. In many ways, it was a transformation, a rebirth into a new era. Transformation or not, let us not romanticize the decline. It was a failure of leadership, a testament to the dangers of negligence by those in power. Leaders who lose touch with their people, who fail to see the threats from beyond their borders, doom their civilizations to be footnotes in history. On a more personal level, the stories of those who lived through these transitions are lost to us. We speak of empires and politics, but what of the individuals who witnessed their world changing around them? Their hopes, fears, and daily struggles are the true casualties of decline. Yet from these ashes rose strategies and adaptations that would inform future empires. The Achaemenids, for one, learned from the failures and successes of Mesopotamian rule, applying these lessons to forge an even greater empire. Each perspective here illustrates the complexity of Mesopotamia's decline. It wasn't simply a matter of military conquest, but a confluence of failed leadership, societal breakdown, and yes, the resilience to influence future generations even in downfall. As ever, the cycle of history shows us that no empire, no matter how grand, is immune to decline. The reasons are as varied as the empires themselves, but the pattern remains. In this pattern, though, there is hope. The legacy of Mesopotamia did not perish with its cities. It was absorbed, transformed, and transmitted by those who came after. We must remember, the end of one era is but the birth of another. Indeed, the ultimate lesson here might be a cautionary tale for all leaders. Neglect your duty, ignore the lessons of history, and you too may lead your civilization into ruin. And so Mesopotamia's story, its decline, and its enduring legacy reminds us of the fragility and the resilience of civilizations. It's a testament to human ingenuity and folly, a narrative that, though ancient, holds lessons that are remarkably relevant to this very day. As we draw this discussion to its close, let us reflect on the undying legacy of Mesopotamia, a civilization that in its zenith and fall teaches us the impermanency of human endeavors. Indeed, the cyclical nature of history is evident through the rise and fall of Mesopotamia. The strategic failures and external pressures that led to its decline serve as a critical lesson in the importance of adaptability and foresight in governance. While reflecting on these cycles, we must not overlook the role of internal corruption and external conquests. The inevitability of decline when a civilization turns inwards 
becoming self-serving rather than addressing the needs of its populace is a timeless warning. Yet, I find it stirring to remember the glories of Mesopotamia, its contributions to law, literature, and science. In every end, a beginning, their legacy fuels the endless pursuit of knowledge and achievement. The Ennead tells us, for san et hayek olim meminise juvabit. This nostalgia, however, must not blind us to the harsh realities of their demise. Leadership fraught with incompetence and the loss of societal values were key contributors to their downfall. A civilization that cannot maintain its foundational ethics is doomed to perish. To those points, I'll add that the lives of those at the helm during these critical junctures are as telling as the broad strokes of history. The eccentricities, virtues, and vices of Mesopotamia's rulers undeniably shaped its course, a pattern repeated throughout history. Each of your insights underscores the complexity of Mesopotamia's narrative, a tale marked by human brilliance and folly alike. As we partake in this endless dialogue with the past, let us carry forth the wisdom gleaned from Mesopotamia's storied lands. Let us not forget, the study of history is not to revel in the past, but to arm ourselves with knowledge to better navigate the future. Mesopotamia's story is a testament to human ingenuity and resilience in the face of adversity. Precisely for history is a guide to navigation in perilous times. Understanding Mesopotamia's chronicle assists us in discerning the underlying patterns that govern human behavior and societal evolution. And in these stories of old, let us find inspiration and cautionary tales alike. The spirit of a civilization lives on not just in its tangible remnants, but in the memory of its aspirations, achievements, and lessons learned. Yet we must tread cautiously, for the allure of glory often blinds us to the faults and failings that beset those we admire. The true legacy of Mesopotamia, as with all civilizations, lies in its entirety, both its grandeur and its grievances. In examining their lives and legacies, we not only honor their memory, but ensure that the wisdom of the ancients remains a beacon for generations to come. Our discourse serves as a vessel for their enduring voices. Thus, as we conclude, let us acknowledge that the essence of Mesopotamia, through its rise, zenith, and eventual decline, imparts indelible lessons on the resilience and fragility of human civilization. May the dialogue continue with history as our eternal guide.